to return the favor for just a minute and tell you a little bit about my first interactions with Gilbert when I walked in six months into the start of that church campus that was in trouble, um, I knew I needed help. And so I asked around who's the smartest person at this church and everybody said Gilbert. So I asked him if he would meet with me. We met for the first few times at the Crystal Springs Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget the way he started the meeting. Because I was coming to him for coaching on leadership and he started off with a DVD player and showing me his wife, Mia, who had died. Because he was telling me, if you want my help mentoring, you need to know who I am. And I watched this 10 minute, I think it was partly her funeral also, and just some pictures of her. Um, I was deeply touched. I also noticed at that meeting that uh, Gilbert was still wearing his wedding ring, although I didn't say anything. And the next meeting we had, I noticed that his wedding ring was not on. So I said something to him, and he turned his wrist over and showed me on his watch band where he had put his wedding ring, and he said, that's as far as I can move it. Which is a beautiful picture of grief and grace. And I have so much respect for him, um, and he also was a very tough mentor and told me many times when I was messing things up, which I appreciated greatly. So that's my background with Gilbert, and I'm really grateful to be here. I'm also grateful to be here just for the few stories that we heard at the very beginning. Part of what I know about a, a time like this when we're all together is I have no idea what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Um, you may find my next 30 minutes or so is the least helpful time of the whole morning, and that's fine. <laughs> Um, I've already been deeply ministered by listening to Roy and Lily's story, and I was thinking when Roy was talking about how easily we forget what Jesus started off his ministry with, and that is the disproportionate impact of small things. I gotta tell you, when you think about these small little groups gathering in Google and Intel and Facebook and LinkedIn and Apple, it's pretty mind-boggling. And I know when I talked to Roy before he got up to speak, he said they're very, very small groups. But that's exactly right. When Jesus started his ministry, he opened his mouth to the smallest consti constituency of people in Israel of the day, the farmers, the rural workers. I got to tell you, as a leadership consultant, I would have coached Jesus many times that he was doing everything wrong. He was going to the wrong people. Instead of talking about big things, he was talking about little things. He gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. As a leadership development director, that made me crazy. <laughs> but for some reason, he saw something in Peter that I wouldn't have seen. And Jesus talked about yeast and salt and light and always, always, always the disproportionate impact of small things. And then I think when Lily, when you were talking, when you talked about the posture of an entrepreneur who comes in not telling people what to do but negotiating, what you really meant was they come in and they serve. Because the first question is, how can I help you? Not, here's my agenda for you. And that's what it means to be a servant leader. So I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about work. It's one of my favorite topics. I love the intersection of faith and work. And I love Dallas Willard's definition of work, which is very simple. Simply, it is the creation of value in the world. That's all work is. It is the creation of value in the world. And I love that so much that I've written that down and I keep it on one of my desks to remind myself when I get so busy that I forget that I'm about creating value in the world. So when I was 14 years old, I locked myself in the bathroom, which for any of you that are parents of teenage kids, this will come as no surprise to you, but it wasn't for the typical reasons you might think. When I was 14 years old, the summer of that 14-year-old part of my life, I did two things. I kind of had two of my very first jobs. The first was through a variety of weird circumstances. I got invited to come over to Catalina Island. I'm an LA native. And with a girlfriend, nanny for a summer, these three young girls. When I told my mom about the opportunity, she immediately said no. My dad winked at me, said, get your bags packed. You're going to Catalina. That was my dad. At the end of the summer, I had a couple weeks before school started, and my dad invited me to come to work with him every day for two weeks. And I worked, and I'm still not sure I'm clear on this, on a, a beginning IBM system that had computer cards with little Chad punch out. Some of you are old enough to go, yeah, I remember those. And I did something to them, although I don't know what I did to them, but I did it for eight hours a day, and I would drive into work with my dad, feeling very important at 14 years old to be given this job. At the end of the two weeks, 
a woman that I had never met before approached me at my desk and handed me an envelope with a little window in it with cellophane paper that I could see through it had my name and my address. I had absolutely no idea what was in that envelope. I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> so I took the envelope and I went to the bathroom and I locked myself in the stall. And I flushed the toilet so I could open the envelope and not make a wrinkle sound, thinking it was going to be a letter asking me to leave. And it was a paycheck. <laughs> it was a real paycheck. It wasn't like Mrs. Brown handed me a water $5 bill for babysitting her kids, and I never did like babysitting very much. It was tight, it had corporate letterhead on it, it had my name on it, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And that was the moment that I fell in love with work. I was a child of the 60s and the 70s, and very unusually, both of my parents worked. That was not typical in those days. And I woke up every morning to the smell of aftershave and perfume, my dad in a suit, drinking coffee at the table, my mom getting all dressed up, getting ready to go to work, fixing eggs for everybody. And there was an air of excitement in that kitchen every morning, like to work was something really special. And I would drive in my mom's turquoise Mustang halfway to work with her where she would drop me off at school and she would take off like she was going to the most exciting adventure in the world. And I knew that someday I was going to share that approach to work. Here's the deal. God designed work to be a powerful force in the world. One of the most strong, shaping, transformational forces in the world. <coughs> And if you're like me, I can forget that sometimes. He designed work to shape us personally. He designed work to shape our teams. And team is just the business word for community. What does it mean to lead in community? And one of my passions is identifying and building cohesive and high-performing teams. It's designed to shape organizations to be transformational places in the community and work is designed to shape cultures and be a global influence and you and I have been invited to participate with God in this work of redemption and renewal that is called work. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes this morning about how do we steward that amazing gift that God has given us. How do we take very seriously as Christ followers what we do with that power that God has bestowed upon us to use it for the good and the lives of other people. And I'm going to start with a story in Scripture, and then I'm going to talk very simply about two things I think we can do in work to make it live up to the force that God intended it for, for it to be. In the book of Haggai and Zechariah, there's this fascinating passage. You, you remember that um, as Israel became God's chosen nation, it was taken out of Egypt and brought into the promised land. And over the course of hundreds of years, with lots of ups and downs, it began to flourish. And under David's leadership and Solomon's leadership, the temple and Israel as a nation re uh, reached a pinnacle of influence in the world. It was looked to as a, a country that was a leader. People understood that they followed a single God, and they were a shining light in the world. And then there began to be a fall and the nation began to crumble, and the Babylonians came in and captured the brightest and the best of Israel and took them into captivity. And for over 70 years, the people of Israel languished in a land very far away. And the Bible tells us that during that time, God said to them, don't fight it, don't grumble and complain, build houses, engage in community work, have your children, and be part of this foreign community. And after 70 years, God worked in history and allowed groups of Israel, Israelites to come back to the Promised Land. And you can imagine that after 70 years away, the older people were telling the younger people, oh, I can't wait for you to go back because you're going to get to see the temple. See, the temple wasn't just the focus of religion in Israel. It was the center of commerce, of education, and spirituality. And people that were my age were telling the younger people when they lived in Babylonia, someday you will get to see the temple. You will get to see the land that we grew up in. It is beautiful. And you can imagine when that first group came back and then the second and third group, and when they went to the place where the temple used to be, 
they found was rubble and just the line of foundation in the ground. A time of great discouragement. And then in Haggai, God speaks to his people through the prophets as they're standing literally around where the temple used to be. Now, when things are bad, like this particular moment, you would think that God would know well enough this is a time for some encouraging words. Again, if I was leadership consulting with God, things would have looked very different. That's not what he does. And all these people are standing around what used to be the temple, and here's what God chooses to say to them. Instead of, guys, you can do this, he says, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Come on. A little encouragement would be really good right now. They're already discouraged enough, and you're just kind of adding to the woundedness. Why does God do this? I think God often surprises us by doing things that we don't expect. And partly what was going on here is God wanted them to live deeply in the reality of how bad things were. Max Dupree, who's been one of my mentors for the last 20 years, is famous for saying the first job of every leader is to define reality. It's the first job of a leader is to define reality. It's not as good as you think. It's not as bad as you think. Here's reality. And one of the quotes that um, Dallas Willard used to say, and I copied it, kept, I keep it in my Bible because I need a constant reminder of it. God has yet to bless anyone except where they actually are. And if we faith, faithlessly discard situation after situation and moment, is, moment by moment is simply not being right, we will have no place to receive his kingdom into our lives. God meets us in reality. And God was giving Israel a second dose of how bad things were. Sometimes optimism is great. Sometimes it's chirpy and unrealistic. And at some point or another, a leader's job is to define reality. And I think that's what God is doing here. Max also would go on to say the last job of a leader is to say thank you. And in between declaring reality and saying thank you, your job as a leader is to serve. Very well known for that little framework of leadership, which I love. And then, after God has really let Israel know how tough this job is going to be, he gives a trifecta of three things to say, here's how we're going to rebuild the temple. And here's where the hope comes back in. And it's very interesting what God says in this particular passage, and what he doesn't say. The first thing he says to the people is, be strong. Find your courage. Somewhere deep inside of you, each individual Israelite who has come back from captivity is a sense of courage inside. And it's been lost for a long time, and you may not know where to find it yet. But you're going to have to go on a journey to your identity and your inner core, and you're going to have to find where that courage exists, and you're going to have to invite it to the surface. And you're going to have to live out of that courage. So be strong is the first thing that God says to his people. And he says, be strong, all you people of the land. The second thing he says is fascinating to me, and I think everybody in this room is going to love it. It's just one word. Be strong, and the next thing God says to his people is work. Work. Roll up your sleeves, get dirt underneath your fingernails, get sweaty and dirty, and go home and take a shower, and tomorrow morning come back ready to do the same thing. Gilbert mentioned one of the things I love to study in leadership is vision. I think vision is really, really wonderful and captivating. But here's the deal. Vision's the easy part. It really is. Anybody can come up with a great vision because it's just our imagination, which is a great thing. I have a venture capitalist right now who's a coach for me in my new role. And he said, anytime I'm looking for somebody to invest in, I look for three things. I look for a great idea, a great leader, and a great team. And Nancy, do you know how much percentage the great idea is? 5%. It's like, really? Yeah. It's the leader and the team and the work they're willing to do together to get it done. So roll up your sleeves and work. Now, here's what's really interesting. Now, I want you to not hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay, you have to think about that one for a minute. But don't hear what I'm not saying. Here's what's interesting. In the three words that God gives his people to rebuild the temple, which is one of the grandest visions he gives his people, 
I want to be real careful now. We're not, are we taking this? Because I could get in trouble. Okay. He doesn't say pray. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. That doesn't mean there aren't hundreds of times in the Bible where God commands his people to pray. But for some reason, in this particular situation, God leans a little to his activistic heart and says, we're probably not going to do it. You're probably not going to be able to sit down for the next 50 years and pray every day and a temple will appear. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to work. And when God uses work as the second thing in this trifecta, what he's saying is work is good. It's great. When it's hard, it's great. When it's easy, it's great. When you have success, it's great. When you have failure, it's great. It's all part of what it means to work. And you'll, you know from reading the book of Nehemiah, God's people took that word very seriously. And they worked. I got to tell you, when you go to the Gospels, we have to be very careful to look at them holistically. Because a lot of times, people that write about spiritual formation, who are mostly introverted men, of which my husband is one, and I love him, but they will focus on the times when Jesus moves away to pray, which is wonderful. I certainly, as a leader, need that reminder. I often will remind my husband there are many more examples, actually more examples, of Jesus ministering to people to the point he is so exhausted he falls asleep or has to get in a boat and get pulled away. One is not better than the other. Our lives are supposed to be an integrated whole where we know discerning wise how to move back and forth between those two. Doing and being are inexorably linked. We can separate them out for a while and that's a good thing. Sometimes we need to just be. But there is a magnetic pull back to the do. And sometimes the do gets so overwhelming that we need to pull that away and go back. And it's this rhythm of life not elevating one over the other. And so God tells his people, you've been taken out of your country. You've been in exile for 70 years. You'd love it if you just came back and the temple was standing. But that's not reality. And so now we have to be courageous and we have to work. And then the third phrase. This is perhaps the most important of all. For I am with you. It is the promise of God's presence. When you find your courage, when you have the guts to work hard, here's what you need to know every single night when you put your head on the pillow. I am pleased with you. I am present with you. Whether it was a good day, a bad day, a hard day, an easy day, or a mediocre day in which you saw no visible, tangible results, I am with you. And there is something in that trifecta of dedication to the work of the temple that reminds me of how important it is and what a sacred trust we have as leaders. How do we steward our leadership as Christ followers, much like the people in this passage had to steward their leadership to rebuild the temple, which was the center of it. So for the last few minutes, I want to talk about two things, two expressions and ways that I think you can do this. And it really is about developing. The first is about developing other people. The second one is about developing yourself. Because remember we mentioned earlier that work is about transforming not just teams and organizations and cultures and the globe, but work also transforms us. Work, Dallas Willard says, is our primary place of discipleship. You will probably have more opportunities in the context of your work to figure out what it means to grow in Christ-likeness than in any other arena of your life. So the first one is to develop other people. Where can people go in this world to work in a place where people overly respect people that are above them and have more money than they do? Pretty much everywhere. Where can they go to find people who value equally all different kinds of people? Probably only where there are Christ followers who are in positions of leadership. When we develop other people and when we view other people as equal to us, we send a message out of the gospel without ever even having to say Jesus' name initially. And people, because they are created in the image of God, whether they believe in God or not, have a magnetic draw to that message. Most of us remember people that developed us and built into us way before we deserved it, but when we were still rough around the edges, when we still had amniotic fluid behind our ears, and they saw something in us. And they came alongside of us and they worked with us where we were. 
and they took us the next step and the next step and the next step. And we now need to turn around and do that for other people. Um, when I was a nurse for those 10 years, after I graduated from college, I started off working in a medical surgical unit. And the first three months, they put you in a mentor program. It's called a mentor program. It's really more like a probation program because you're a brand new nurse and you don't know what you're doing and they want to make sure that you don't hurt anybody. I would drive to work every single day praying one prayer and I would say it over and over again in the car, don't let me kill anybody today. Tomorrow's fine. Don't let me kill anybody today. Tomorrow's fine. Don't let me kill anybody today. Fine, let me kill anybody today. I was terrified. And I worked at a Catholic hospital so the director of nurses was a very formidable nun. She was about four eight, eight inches high, and when she walked down the halls, the surgeons ran in terror. <laughs> so I'm a brand new nurse. I'm petrified of this woman. I don't ever have a single conversation with her in the first three months. So at the end of my probation mentorship time, where you're on day shift because they have to keep an eye on you, you get flung over into either night shift or swing shift, and I got swing shift. So I knew in two weeks I was going to start the 3 to 11.30 shift. I had one little problem. My boyfriend at the time, whose name was not John, so you can extrapolate that one for yourselves, um, was coming home from college for two weeks at Christmas. It was the only time I would see him until Easter. I really, really wanted to get permission to spend two more weeks on the day shift before I went to swing shift or I wouldn't get to see him at all. No problem, because the only person I had to ask was the director of nurses. Oh my gosh, I was terrified. So I would practice and rehearse at home. I would write out what I was gonna say. I had to ask a nun for permission to stay on the day shift so I could see my boyfriend. This was not gonna go well. <laughs> not looking forward to this. So I finally got up enough courage and I intercepted her at one moment and I said, Sister Dorothy, my name's Nancy Bird and I work on Three East and I just started a few months ago and then I started to go into my spiel and she stopped me right in the middle of my conversation and she said to me, four words, I know who you are. That was 35 years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. I went on to say, here's what I need. She gave me permission to spend two, day, two weeks on day shift. I got to see Dan, we broke up, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> she said to me, I know who you are. And then she said, and this was a large hospital. Then she said, what I hear about you is good enough that I'm guessing in a year, after you've had a little more experience, and you haven't hurt anybody too bad, um, we're probably going to consider you for a charge nurse position. Oh, she knew who I was. There was no reason in the world she needed to do that. But there was something in her that paid attention to people. Best definition I've ever heard about of leadership, and I've been collecting definitions for 30 years now, is this. Leadership is creating a way for people to contribute to make something extraordinary. Leadership is about creating a way for people to contribute to make something extraordinary happen. And the reason I love that, the first time I heard it, I remember thinking, why do I love that so much? And it dawned on me that's exactly what Jesus did. In all four Gospels, in the first two chapters of two of the Gospels, and in the fourth chapter of the second two, Jesus calls a group of 12 to be around him. He says, hey, if I'm going to pull this off, I need a team. If God needs a team, you need a team. We all need a team. And what's so fascinating is only in one of the Gospels does it connect Jesus praying for who he chose. Because I get, I get that message all the time. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, and then he picked these special, special, special 12 people. Actually, I don't think that's what happened at all. I think Jesus kind of walked down the street and went, yeah, I can do it with you. Yep, I can make you work. Not a problem. We can do, I can pretty much do this with anybody. Because that's pretty much what he did. These were a bunch of yahoos. They were tax collectors who hated each other, doctors who felt superior, Peter who was just a joke and made more mistakes in four Gospels than any of the rest of the disciples combined. Seriously, when Jesus left the earth, the fact that his movement continued is absolutely miraculous. It was a mess. It was a mess. And Jesus said, I'm going to create a way for every one of you to contribute to make something extraordinary happen. That's what great leadership does. When you develop other people, there's a very simple framework I like to use, and it's just three things. I use it in a triangle. You want to give people opportunities. So you've got to get to know them a little bit. You've got to investigate people before you invest in them. You've got to get to know them a little bit. You've got to figure out how they're wired, 
how mature they are, what their giftedness is, how experienced they are. You want to give them an opportunity to do something that they're good at. You don't want to give them an opportunity to do something you're bad at. That would be a bad thing. You wouldn't want to hire me to be your CFO. That would be a bad decision on your part. It's not my strength. So you want to know people well enough to know, I think you would be good in this role. You want to give people opportunities. Now, obviously, when you give them an opportunity, you want to stay alongside of them and watch them and coach them and be with them. That's exactly what Jesus did. You don't want to leave them on their own, but you want to give them feedback all the time, the good, the bad, the ugly. And believe me, the good's easier to say, but as Christ followers, we have to have the courage to engage in necessary conflict and have difficult situations, difficult conversations. Second thing you want to do for people if you're going to develop them beyond opportunities is you want to challenge them. Every once in a while, people need to be stretched, and you want to either give them an opportunity that's a little bit beyond them, or it might be a difficult interpersonal conversation that you need to have with them. You need to challenge them. People <coughs> languish when they're just left in positions. So you want to give them an opportunity, you want to give them a challenge, and you want to give them a relationship. You want to give them more people. People are best developed by people who know about them and care about them. That's why your scope of development is only a small scope. But when you develop people, then you know what happens. They turn around and develop other people just like the disciples did with Jesus' movement. Last thing I want to say about developing other people, and this is for me out of my life, probably one of the most profound defining moments I had in watching another leader. After I did a couple of years up in the medical surgical floor and Dan and I broke up and I went down to work in the emergency room and it was one of my favorite jobs. I was actually working in the emergency room when I met John on a blind date and I was so tired from working in the emergency room I actually fell asleep on our blind date so you know then there's that but it worked out okay. Uh, but I loved working in the emergency room and I especially loved working in the ER when I would come in for my shift and there was the name on the board of a doctor that I loved working with. He was a Christ follower, but he didn't wear it on his sleeve. He didn't talk to a lot of people about that, but I knew that about him. But what I really loved about working with him is he had a way of making a disparate group of people into a team. And here's what I mean by that. When you work in the emergency room, you have a core group of people that work together all the time. But when you have a code, when somebody comes in a life-threatening situation, you call laboratory, you call x-ray, you call pharmacy, you call respiratory, and all of a sudden you have people around this gurney who don't even know each other's name. And we're in a very urgent situation and we have to be able to perform like a team. And it takes a very gifted leader to be able to pull that off. And every time I worked with that doctor, and I was not the only one that would get excited when we saw his name up there, you knew you were gonna learn something that night and you, learned, you realized you were gonna just be playing at your very best because of who he was. And I remember one night in particular, a young girl came in in her mid-20s, and I remember it because when somebody is in a crisis situation at that age, the stakes are just high. She came in in a code, we worked on her for three and a half hours before we knew would we send her to the intensive care unit or to the morgue. And during that time, this doctor did what he did best. He would orchestrate our performances if we drew blood and we had to wait for the lab results to come back stat before we knew what medicine to give, if there was like a two minute lull, he would say, Nancy, what would you do next? There was no, he didn't need to ask me that. I wasn't a doctor, I was a nurse. He made me feel like part of the team. He was teaching me. Okay, I'm gonna put the chest tube in. Where do I go in here? Okay, these are what the uh, lab results came back at. What medicine should I push next? And he was constantly bringing us together. At the end of the code, we stabilized her. A bunch of the nurses took her and all of her tubes upstairs on a gurney at the intensive care unit. Housekeeping came in and cleaned the room up. I stayed back to finish charting, and my doctor stayed behind to coach the intern that was working with him. They spent about 25 minutes together, and they debriefed some of the top-level decisions. Why do you think I pushed that drug at that point? What would you have done differently there? And then, at the very end of the conversation, he said something that made me think, yeah, I'm done charting, but I'm not leaving because I'm going to eavesdrop on this conversation. This is what nurses do. I'm just going to pretend like I'm still writing. And he said to the intern, hey, did you notice at the end of the code when the guy from housekeeping came in? I knew exactly where he was going with this one because I knew who he was. The intern looked at him with a puzzled look like, why are you wasting my time on this question? And as soon as that face showed up on his face, I knew my doctor was going to have a long conversation. And he said, well, his name's Carlos. Still, nothing on the intern's face that indicated he got where this conversation was going. He said, let me tell you a little bit about Carlos. 
Carlos comes in after a code and cleans this room up and puts everything back exactly where it belongs so quickly that when the next person comes in this room, we're able to do our jobs at a very high level. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah, I guess. Huh. And then he put his arm around the intern's shoulder, and gave it a little squeeze, and he said, let's do this. I see on the schedule that next Tuesday night, you and I are scheduled to work together again. Here's your assignment. Guy got out a little notepad. He said, I want you to come on the shift at 3 o'clock ready to tell me something about Carlos that I don't already know. <laughs> what just happened here? <laughs> and then he said this. Carlos' wife's name is Maria. They have four children. He named each one of the children their age. He said, Carlos has been up from Mexico for about a year and a half, and he lives about three blocks from here in an apartment. You can't tell me any of those things, because I already know that about Carlos. You get to know Carlos. One of the most amazing gifts Christian leaders can give to organizations in a way that is deeply shaping and transforming at a personal level, a team level, an organizational level, and a cultural level is to value all kinds of different people because it's a picture of the kingdom of God. And most people go to work and that's not what they see. They see a bunch of people that have, have, have access to education and have money getting put up on a pedestal and they see other people getting diminished as less than. And when you as a leader take time to make a team out of people and say we all might do very different things, but we are equally valued as human beings and you're important on my team, and you're important on my team, people see the kingdom of God. And then the last thing I would say is we have to develop ourselves too. God will do things in you as a leader for your entire life that will shape who you are on the inside. Because part of work will heal you. And part of work will harm you. Your calling is not your healing. And you never outgrow your brokenness. And some of our brokenness drives us in our ambition and our busyness. Not all of it. But you have to be a discerning Christ follower and constantly conversing with God about when should I detach, when should I relax. When your brokenness and your pain has not been processed well over time, it will leak out in your leadership. I don't think I'm the only one in this room who sometimes as a leader feels a level of RPM energy inside of me that I find difficult to slow down and pace out. And sometimes it's a really good thing. When you go to the emergency room, you don't really want a laid back doctor who's saying, yeah, I'm taking a coffee break right now, just wait for a minute. You want somebody that can plunge in and work at a very high level. But you also know you need to have a leader that can put the clutch in and switch gears and not take themselves too seriously and disengage and relax and be with God. I certainly remember periods of time in my own leadership where I was racing so hard and I feel like God whispered to me, do you really believe that I'm at work when you're not? To which I said, nope, <laughs> I don't. I don't believe that if I'm not working, that something's going to, I believe it's all going to unravel. And I've been on a lifelong journey with God for me to understand God's got it. He's in control. He's working when I'm not. And it's okay to rest. It's interesting that in Moses' life, it wasn't a moral failure that took his leadership away. It was an emotional failure. It was an anger issue that had roots back when he was a young man and he killed the Egyptian, that he reared its ugly head under stress in leadership, and he struck the rock when God told him to speak to him. And it wasn't adultery, but it was a brokenness inside that apparently Moses had not brought to God and said, for the rest of my life, I've got to work on this with you. You don't outgrow your brokenness, and we have to remember who the Lord of the work is. One of the best gifts that any leader can give an organization is the ability to bring a non-anxious presence to our work. Harvard Business Review has written about this. Yale Review has written about this. What does it mean to be a non-anxious presence? And oughtn't Christ followers and leaders that are Christ followers be some of the best people in our world that bring a non-anxious presence? And part of that is the lifelong journey with God to say, what am I afraid of? And most leaders are very unaware 
that much of their behavior is driven by fear and anxiety. Because it doesn't look like the typical kind of fear and anxiety, but high control and busyness that you can't control is another way of expressing fear. I read an article recently that said probably between 4 to 24 percent, I have no idea where they get these numbers, but between 4 and 24 percent of your work day is probably just driven by anxiety and the belief that if I just work an extra hour, I'm controlling something. And what a great journey to go on with God to be the kind of leader that can disengage when they need to disengage and enter into work at a very high level when we need to enter in at that and know how to go back and forth. What are the private practices that make you fruitful in public? What are the rhythms of your life that you leave behind the scenes that renew the life of God in you and put you in full and aware understanding that this is not all on your shoulders? I have to say, I think the strangest thing that Jesus said, and he said some really strange things, was my yoke is easy. To which I say, really? It's easy? Because it doesn't feel easy. Well, then guess who something's wrong with? Me. I'm the one that has to be shifting my thinking. And we have to constantly be working at how do we develop ourselves. Last thing I want to say on this one. Uh, when I was at Willow Creek, the last five years that I worked at Willow Creek, I took over a ministry that was designated for the 18 to 20-something generation. It was the postmodern ministry. Um, it had started three years before me. It met in the gym on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. It was started by a really young, hip Gen Xer who wanted to reach his generation. There were some issues with his leadership after about three years. They did a year-long search for the next leader. Make a long story short, I got chosen. All I can tell you is this team that had been together, the staff that was wanting to reach their own generation for Christ of 18 to 30 year olds, were not hoping to get a middle-aged mom to be their new leader. <laughs> I had to tell you the first six months I was there, they were rude to me, Christian rude. You know, the kind you can't quite put your finger on, but you know they don't want you there. But if you put your finger on it, they say, no, I didn't mean that. What's wrong with you? Uh, my first day at work, I talked to Steve, who was the director of programming, which meant he put on the weekend services, the music, the, the drama, the videos, the whole flow of that. And I said to him, Steve, one of the programming meetings. And he said, oh, we don't need you to come to those meetings. I said, really? Man, one of the main things we do besides small groups and evangelism and outreach and services, our weekend services, I think I should be at those meetings. No, no. There's so many other things that are broken right now in this ministry. You need to have your time spent on those. This part's fine. You don't need to be at those meetings. Maybe there's something I'm not. So I called Steve into my office after a couple of weeks, and I pulled out my job description. And I said, come here, look at this. I'm responsible for the weekend services. I'm going to have to go to that meeting. See, when is the meeting and where is the meeting? I'm coming to the meeting. It was awful. And after about six months, he and I danced around each other enough to begin to build trust. We begin to have conflict. We begin to understand each other. And we developed a terrific relationship, but it started off really well. And then, about a year later, when things were going quite well, Steve came into my office, because we had a great relationship, and he said, can I talk to you? I said, of course you can. He said, I need to tell you something, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. Which is a really bad way to start a conversation. <laughs> so there's not going to be this Oreo cookie approach. And he sat down and he said, this is his exact quote, your meetings suck. <laughs> so, is there anything good? No, no, nothing good. <laughs> So on the outside, I said, oh, oh, tell me more. And on the inside, I thought, you still have amniotic fluid behind you. <laughs> you have no idea what I do all day long and how hard I work. And then he said this, when you first came here, really up to the first year, your meetings were so amazing. They were at the top of the whole organization. They were different and creative and provocative and awe-inspiring and inspirational. And we made a lot of progress and got some momentum. And he said, I don't know what you're paying attention to now, but they're awful in comparison to where they were. Now, I've got to tell you, he was 24 years old and I was 40-something. <laughs> Everything in me wanted to say, you have no idea what you're talking about. And the Holy Spirit sort of whispered, what well, part of what he just said to you is not true? <laughs> and where's the humility of a leader to say, I think you might be right. Dallas Willard has a great definition for humility. One word, 
reality. That's what humility is. It's just reality. Is it possible that my meeting sucked? Dang it, he was right. I mean, I drove home like, no, they don't, no, they don't, no, they don't. Yeah, they do. <laughs> what happened is I got all these plates in. The, organ the, the ministry was kind of a mess. And I love to get in and clean up messes. I love re-engineering, team building, visionary leader. I love it. I get all these plates. My meetings are going well. I'm attending to this. The finances are finally right. We're getting our small groups going. We're, we're serving the poor. And all of a sudden, this plate that was my meetings, which is one of my most important jobs as a leader, are my people. I just started to take for granted. I turned it over to my operations director, who was great at operations, but completely uninspiring. And he would just go through a checklist, a tactical checklist at every meeting. People were like, shoot me in the head. Where's the vision? <laughs> And I had to admit he was right. And so the next time we had a staff meeting, I said, uh, Steve and I just had a conversation about our meetings. And of course, there was a little rump, rump, ripple through the crowd because he had been talking, they had all been talking about it behind my back, which is what we did. <laughs> and I said, I have to apologize to you. You're absolutely right. And I have completely dropped the ball on paying attention to one of my most important jobs ever. And work is like that. Work is a force that will shape not just other people and not just the world, but it will shape you. And it will get you ready at the end of your life when you are not working anymore and you are laying on your deathbed to be really grateful that you know Jesus. Because you found him in work, but work wasn't the main thing. Work was just an expression of worship. It was just one way in which you got to love the world. Your family, as wonderful as your family is, even it's not the main thing. The main thing is Jesus. Always has been, always will be. And my prayer is that your work will help you realize that on a daily basis. Wow, that was good. We're going to ask you to come back up here because we have a tradition of loading. A nice goodie bag for the speakers, maybe. Wow. And you bring our Prince of Peace bag, and I'm going to ask our CEA leadership to come up and take a picture of Nancy as she eats this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Whoa! Thank you. Thank you very much. Holy cow! And give it a So next time I. Oh, Robert is on. Robert would come up, but he's on crutches. You don't want to call him. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, he just came out of surgery. Here, I scoot over one little bit. Okay, perfect. This is awkward. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This is amazing. <laughs> I've never received a gift bag this big. <laughs> you done.